I am amateur beekeeper, but fascinated by everything. Um, professionally, I'm an engineer, particularly a software engineer. So I like to understand how stuff works. I like to understand the mechanisms behind stuff. And so honeycomb came up as a point of fascination. And I started asking questions of universities. And it turned out nobody actually knew the answers. And Lars Chitka um, invited me to just spend some time in his lab and then agreed to be my supervisor. So I am a somewhat mature uh, PhD student. I'm now fortunately in my fourth year and should have a thesis, but not quite done yet. This is a major, um, or this is one chapter in my thesis that you're going to get today, but without all the words, more pictures than words. Um, so honeycomb, as beekeepers, you will doubtless have been fascinated by it, but it has fascinated humans for millennia, but scientists in particular have been looking at it more closely in the last couple of hundred years, and there's a list of scientists that have looked at it on the screen there, and all of the big names and many much more minor scientists have been investigating. But most of the papers that have been written about it have said what it comprises, what the actual shapes are. As to how it's been built, there's been some speculative work by um, Martin and Landau did some um, extremely exquisite work in trying to work out how the bees actually shape the honeycomb and they achieved this in, as was the tradition of science in the day, of doing things like gluing the necks of the bees so they couldn't move their heads and understanding how that impacted the shape of honeycomb that they um, built. But the fascination about the hexagonal shape has persisted. And there's been a couple of ideas that have been mooted. Oh, it's thermoplasticity. The wax forms itself into that shape, which was then debunked and then reinforced. And I think everybody accepts it as complete bunkum now. But nonetheless, I still keep getting people say, oh, it, the wax just flows, doesn't it? No. The bees definitely shape it. So we can put that one to bed. The bees are responsible for the shape of the honeycomb. Um, but how the construction is shaped in those hexagonal shapes and more that we'll see, there's been very, very little work on that until now. Most of the work that has been written about honeycomb has eulogized its perfection. And a single piece of honeycomb in the regular hexagonal form is undoubtedly beautiful and very regular. Well, apart from where it's fixed to the top, oh yeah, and where combs join, and then when they want to put some drone in the middle of some worker, it's a bit messy there as well. So it's sort of perfect. No, it's not. It's a, it's a complete mess. The bees are very good, however, at making that multiplicity of differences work together. And as a researcher, I realized that there was no point in looking at a perfect hexagonal piece of honeycomb, because when I looked at the next one, it was identical and told me nothing more than when I inspected the first one. The clue to how bees build honeycomb is actually in the imperfections. And the bees have to have a simple way of building honeycomb because they're working with tiny specks of wax that are placed in um, position and gradually construct the cells which construct the comb. But they're adept enough that they can build in any direction. Normally they will build down, but obviously they're building the sides of the tongues of comb, so they're quite adept at building sideways and repeating the cell structure while they do it. And if coerced, you can force them to build it upwards as well. So whatever algorithm, and I will use that word habitually because I do, it simply means a set of rules that they follow. Whatever those rules are, have got to be adaptable enough to work in all directions and to cope with discontinuities and errors, because bees make mistakes, but they keep getting corrected. So it's a very flexible algorithm. What is it? New word for the day, stigmagy. Stigmagy simply means responding to whatever the workpiece is in front of you. 
and it is fabulously valuable. It was originally coined in the 60s when Grasso was looking at termites and trying to work out how do they build termite mounds. And the rules that he came up with were along the lines of if there's a pile of dirt in front of you and you've got a grain of sand in your mouth, you put it on top. That's the rule. And from that, you get pillars. You don't need any particular sophistication to be able to build a pillar if all the termites are simply following the rule, put it on top. And pillars arrive automatically out of a simple set of rules. Smith and other researchers um, then started looking at the way wasps respond. And the observation they had was that the funnel building um, wasp, which is a solitary wasp, starts with a hole in the ground, which is where its nest is. And because there's a hole that is facing skyward, she starts building a tube. And then the next stage of construction is when it's long enough, she will turn it and build the funnel. And what Smith found is that if you cut a hole in the top, she doesn't fill the hole. She thinks, oh, there's a hole that's facing skyward. I must start building a tube upwards towards the sky. So clearly the wasp was following a repeated set of rules. That is stigmagy. Stigmagy is closely allied with self-organising algorithms, that is, algorithms that fix things. And um, Karmazin, fabulous writer, fabulous observer, um, when he was writing papers proclaiming self-organisation in biological systems, had a lot of pushback from people saying, oh, they're not self-organised, the, the, the biology is thinking about it. And he said, no, they're just doing simple rules, and out of that, this wonderful complexity arrives. For example, how much thinking does a grain of sand do when you get ripples in sand dunes? Those are self-organising. There is a simple mechanism behind the small-scale ripples and, indeed, the large-scale ripples that are the dunes themselves. So clearly there is scope for trivial operations that lead to larger-scale architecture. And when I found this work, I thought, there's really something here. This could account for how honeycomb is constructed. Um, recently, stigma G has been taken up. Um, it's been dropped by biologists because they know everything that needs to know. Don't worry about it anymore. But roboticists have picked this up big time. How do you build in space? Looking ahead, how are we going to build on the moon or on Mars? You can't control the robots. It's not like flying a drone where you've got line of sight and immediate control. It's not like driving a car across the floor. The thing's got to run on its own because if you're working on the moon, you've got something like a second and a half between what the robot sees, coming back to you, to the control system. If you're working on Mars, you've got more like 20 or 30 minutes of flight time. Therefore, the robots have got to look after themselves and stigmagy is where all of the research is going, and so the researchers are building autonomous robots that can just look at the workpiece and decide for themselves what needs doing. And it has fabulous advantages in that the robots are able to just follow trivial rules. Trivial means easy to program, less likelihood of going wrong. They are each making independent decisions as opposed to a central mind, which is controlling everything. Because if you have a central mind, it can fail and then your entire workforce stops working. So you've got robustness and reliability built into it. Do you see any analogies here with the collective workings of a eusocial animal inside a beehive? They're all doing individual work, but there is no collective mind. There is nobody directing. There isn't an architect. But those little jobs conspire to form the architecture that we see. So my research goal was to find out how that happened. Stigmagy isn't trivial. So this wasp, the Sphex, has just caught its prey, brought it back to her nest, gone into the nest, checked the nest, come out and picked up the prey. Step one was to deposit, step two, go down the nest. Now, as a researcher, 
If you move the prey, the wasp comes back out and says, what? Oh, the prey's in the wrong place. I must go back to step one and put it where it belongs. So she's found the prey, takes it back to the front of the nest, And the apocryphal stories are, this continues ad infinitum. It's stigmagy, it's robotic, it's stupid. Except it's not stupid. Because what actually happens, and I can't remember if the video goes on to show it. No, it doesn't. Fabra when he first found this wasp and started tormenting the poor critters like this, actually wrote in his paper in 1879, after two or three experiments, the, the wasp just immediately abandoned the procedural work and just said, grab it, drag it in. So yes, it's stigmagy. There is a set of rules that the wasp was following but when those rules failed, the wasp was able to make a thoughtful, but it was certainly able to deviate from those rules. So stigmagy is a means of prompting work, but does not prohibit innovative behavior beyond that. And that might be learned behavior, and indeed it might be thinking. Don't discredit the possibility that very small brains are actually able to carry two, three, half a dozen rules. I don't care how many or how few it is. But if they're actually able to make a judgment as to which rule should I apply in this particular set of circumstances, you have got something that can follow some simple rules and achieve wonderful things with the flexibility of choosing which rule is most appropriate to the current situation. It's still stigmatic because it's prompted by the current state of the workpiece. Try getting that past the engineers of my world. Um, Stigmagy has been researched in wasp nest construction um, and work over in the late 80s and early 90s um, was looking at um, how the wasps build nests, which are again fabulous architectural structures, but predominantly they're hanging and there are pillar constructions and then nest cell constructions. And what the work was doing was saying, if you've got N cells of this type, then you put another cell of another type. And that was done through software simulation. And the simulations produced 3D diagrams that were very akin to the real nests that WASP were building. But the concept of that is that the unit that the WASPs were working with is a cell. But a cell in our case, is not a unit of construction. Much the same as a house is built from rooms, but a room is not the unit of construction. In fact, the unit of construction for a house and a room is a brick. Hence the subject of this talk is that don't think about how you build a house by saying, and there's a room and there's another room. Think smaller scale, how do you build those cells themselves is where I wanted to go. But nonetheless, it gives me an opportunity to introduce the prospect that simple rule following does allow, for example, bricks to be laid exquisitely neatly. That brick laying robot lays bricks far better than a, um, a normal human bricky. And if you were watching the video, and if not, go and find it on YouTube. If you watch a normal bricky put a brick in place, slops some muck onto it, plonks it onto the wall, stands back, eyeballs it, tap, 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 puts a spirit level against it, then goes on to the next brick. The robot did no such thing. It put the right amount of mortar onto it, put the brick in place, and the brick was in the right place, then moved on to the next one. There was no shuffling, there was no nothing. The right amount of pressure and the brick was level, just went on. So the bricklaying robot is following some rules to the letter, exquisitely like no biological system could possibly do. But nonetheless, this is intended to suggest in your minds that by following some rules and placing your small element of construction in accordance with the rest of the workpiece, 
the brick, oh, sorry, the brick on the wall is probably how the bees build cells. So the stigmagy research that was looking at wasps as a cell as a complete unit, I wanted to take much, much finer scale and say, how do they deposit a speck of wax and start forming straight walls and start forming hexagons? So the cell is not the unit. The elements that make up the cell are in much the same way as um, a wall is built out of bricks, honeycomb is built out of specks of wax. Don't you just love the fact that I found a hexagonal brick construction? So are the wax, wax specks laid according to some rules? And spoiler, yes and no. But it has been a worthy question for me to tackle over the last few years. So I'm going to look at the steps of building comb, uh, wax into comb. Um, and there are three fundamental steps. There is the additive process of depositing the wax in the first place. There's actually a phenomenal amount of subtractive work that goes on. And it took me a long time to convince my supervisor that A, this happened, and B, it was a worthy part of the the stigmagy process. Um, and then there's geometry. This is the big one, because they're just beautifully elegant and geometrically perfect. Not, but there you go. Um, so the question is, how do the bees sculpt? And it is a process of sculpture, but how do they measure the angles, for example? So taking each of those steps in turn, the additive the bees start by adding small amounts. And if you look at the um, expanded diagram in the center, which is looking close up, you can see that when I gave them some small pieces to play with, the first thing they start doing is just to deposit tiny, tiny specks of wax somewhere. We'll come back to where they deposit them to start with, but they start by putting some wax in place. And the picture lower center shows you that those deposits, as they build, start to take on a circular form. Don't know hexagons here. These are circles. The bees form circles. The bees also remove wax where it's in the wrong place. So, for example, that triangular stimulus that I gave them, there was a concentration of wax um, in the middle. And that was wrong. The bees knew it was wrong, wasn't going to give them a sensible cell. So if you look at the picture in the middle at the bottom, they've just sculpted it out. They've just taken the wax away. So additive to start with, adapting to the circumstances by taking wax away, and the geometry. There is a concept of the distance the bees know basically the diameter of a worker cell. There's actually a slightly different set of rules and they also know the diameter of a drone cell and they will change the size but they've basically got two fundamental measures that they're working on. Please nobody ask me about queen cells, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> um, angles. I'm sorry you're going to hear a lot about angles in this talk. But you can see, f even from that picture there, there is a construction that has been brought out in this photo horizontally and has immediately fanned out. It got to the right distance, so the bee knew how far it had to go, worker cell size, and then it needed to bifurcate. And we can already see 120 degrees without reference to anything else. How did she do that? There is a certain thickness. Actually, Martin and Landau, in their um, 40s paper, have answered the question as to how do the bees measure how thick the cell walls need to be. And the way they do that is that they sculpt the wax by scraping it with their mandibles, and they know how thick the wall is, even working from one side, because they antenate. So they touch their antenna against the wax and as they're sculpting it they can feel the wax flexing and if it flexes too much they stop if it doesn't flex very much 
more work needs to be taken off. So the, the bees actually have a micrometer. It is the flexibility of the wax. So they, they will take the wax down to the right thickness and it's in a straight line. So angle and linearity are the two questions I felt I needed to answer. Back to the additive. Where do bees add wax? Stigmagy, of course, suggests that they should be finding something in the workpiece that says, place wax here. Where's here? Um, so some of my experiments, I prompted them by using a back plane of wax and then just pressing a stylus into it to form a shallow dimple. It didn't bulge the other side, it just pushed into the top surface. And what I found was the bees then willingly started cells by adding to the rims. So the rim of where I indented it was effectively raised from the two surfaces. There was a sort of ridge and the bees followed it. Not precisely because I had deliberately made the dimples that I put in much smaller than a cell. So they couldn't just slavishly follow but I wanted to see whether or not they followed the cells at all. And so what I did was I put the dimples into it, and so you've got a before photograph and then an after photograph, and the photograph on the right is the way I did most of this research, which is to actually then superimpose the before and after photos and then say, ah, these cells line up in this way with the stimuli. But how much do they line up? bit of math here. I had to have a metric as to how well the dimple aligned with the cell and I chose how many degrees of the circle the cell overlapped the original dimple. And on the right hand side there's a, um, a heat map as to in theory how much it should overlap. And then what I did was I sat down with hundreds of these photographs going, oh, there's the centre of the cell, there's the centre of the dimple. There's all of the overlaps. Click, 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 click. My shoulder and my wrist were completely trashed from sitting there with a mouse for months on this and many similar photographs. Don't do a PhD. It really isn't worth it. And what I did was I measured the alignment of the cells to the original dimples, and then I got the software to just randomly place a pseudo dimple somewhere, and I then did the same metric for that the feeling being that I'd had a control population, the random placement, versus the measured population, how well did they actually align? And these are the results that I got. So um, the top chart shows four, three different samples measuring dozens of cells on them. You can see that each of them, the alignment of the pressed dimples to the cells is much higher than that of the randomly placed cells. And if you stick all those populations together, everything becomes even more evident. And in science, the way you measure whether or not your hypothesis is right is you say, and what's the probability of it happening by accident? And in this case, the probability is less than one in 10,000, so really low. That's, that's as strong a proof as you need. So the bees are guided by those dimples that I put in there. The reason I actually looked at dimples in the first place is I noticed when I gave them just plain bits of wax and left them in there for half an hour or an hour and took them out. By the way, my bees really cross. I was opening up my hives four times a day. None, none of this weekly inspection rubbish. I noticed that the bees were actually quite good at sculpting dimples out. Oh, why are they doing that? So I put the dimples in and they then became the focus as to where they built cells. Where I had built the dimples and the bees started work, they actually dug them deeper and pushed them out the other side. So what I then did was I looked at what was the alignment of the cells on the obverse with the center of the dimples. And again, before, after, photograph, compare, and then a bit of theory. If you think of it could be anywhere, 
the further away from the triform of the cell intersection, the greater the likelihood, because it, the, the center of the dimple could be anywhere but actually increasingly more opportunities towards the base of the triangle. So you get an off-center probability that rises. If I saw that distribution, then it's probably just random. But what I actually saw was this distribution, which means that the bees are setting the triple intersection of cell walls close to the center of the reverse of the dimples. So that tells me that on both the face they're focusing their attention on the edges of the rim, a raised surface, and on the back, they're focusing the initial cell wall construction on the top of the dome, the raised part. So much like the termites, place wax here is basically something that's raised. It's fairly trivial, but it works beautifully. Geometry, now we get onto the interesting stuff. The geometry of a cell is actually a rhombic dodecahedron on the top of a um, hexagonal prism. You all know it as a honeycomb cell. And they tessellate perfectly, but the really important thing is they tessellate back to back. That's the beauty of the base. Everyone goes on about the wonderful hexagonal nature of the face of honeycomb. It's got nothing compared with the base of honeycomb. A lot of the early work has been in measuring the bases and the cell sizes, and there are some bizarre dis um, measurements. So if you measure the rhombi at the bottom, unit di dimension in one, but the other dimension is the square root of two. Wow, that's an odd number. Um, and if you measure the angles, we get 109.4 degrees. So, of course, we've all seen our bees walking around with that 104.9 degree set square in their back pocket. They're, they're born with them. The, the queen issues them free of charge. Except they're not. Because that's what you get if you measure the cells in the wrong way. If you measure the cells at what's called the dihedral angle, which is where any two surfaces come together in a join, and if at that join you measure at right angles to the join itself, regardless of where the actual surfaces are, that's the dihedral angle. When you go home, put a set square on any of your honeycomb and you will find the dihedral angle is 120 degrees. The entire cell is built at 120 degrees not only the bit you can see, but the base as well. So what? I assert that 90 degrees and 120 degrees are the same thing, and the reason that I assert that will become clear, but that's also true of all other reflex angles. So if you look at the bit on the right-hand side, you'll see that where there was a straight wall, for the bees to begin construction against. I gave them a straight line stimulus and said, go build. And they did. And they built it 90 degrees. But if you then look at more random bits of comb and measure the angles, you will find that wherever there were two surfaces coming together, the third surface comes off at an equal angle from the two surfaces, whatever that angle started. And if you want everything balanced, you get 120 degrees all round. But whatever it is, if it's 180 degrees do you start with, you'll come off at 90. And so on and so forth. All they're doing is halving the angle. They're not doing anything more than that. They don't need a compass, a set square, a protractor. They don't need anything. They just need to be able to measure both angles. But how do they do that? They don't build to those angles. Oh, spoiler, I've let the game out. They actually move stuff around a lot. And so the whole premise on how they achieve these geometries is through wall plasticity. And if you look at the largest picture in the middle, I've got overlaid the original linear stimulus I gave them, 
and together with that, the cells that they eventually built. And the original stimulus I gave them is just gone. And in its place is a beautiful zigzag, which is hexagonal cells interlocked. On the left-hand side, however, they've persisted and the 90-degree orthogonal cell walls against the stimulus have stayed. There's a reason for that. The stimulus on the left-hand side, purely by accident, I made some out of paper. I wax-coated some paper and gave that to them as stimulus. And they can't move the paper. Well, I say they can't move the paper. Probably three-quarters of the stimuli that I gave them that were based on paper just got shredded and destroyed and thrown out of the hive. But the ones that survived, they couldn't move. So if they were unable to move it, they just contented themselves and then corrected it in the next la layer of cells. But once they're able to move it, they move it. And an example of how cell walls move is that young cells, those that have only just been started and most importantly do not yet have a neighbour, are built with curved walls. So at the bottom, you can see a photograph of a piece of test that was only about three, four hours old. And then three or four hours later, the same cells that I've lined up with the arrows, you'll see what were curved walls have now become straight walls. Why? Because there's a cell next to them now. At the beginning of their life, the cell was on its own and just comprised circular walls. But as soon as the bees built cells alongside it, they pushed the walls straight. And of course this is science, so I had to measure it. So I came up with a degree of curvature, and I measured a lot of cells at the before photos, and I then measured the same cells in the after photos. So the two blocks you see are the two populations, the curvature at the beginning and the curvature once they've stabilised, and they're clearly separate. But more important than that, the lines that go from one to the other show each individual cell. And so on those lines you can see most of the cells are going from curved down to much less curved. So each of the cell walls has been straightened as a result of having another cell built alongside it. Again, an example of how the bees start with circles. If you start with a relatively thick stimulus and the bees build alongside it, the circular nature of the cell they build actually goes into the piece of wax. So the piece in the middle shows it best and you can see on the right hand side of that circular cells that have actually eroded out of the wax. And that erosion will keep going until they form cells on the other side. And as the erosion happens and cells form on the other side, eventually that thick piece of wax is eroded sufficiently thinly that it then becomes a straight, thin wall between the two cells. As indeed you can see in this photograph there. That's a substantially thick piece of wax. That piece of wax um, that's bent into a V-shape at the top is about a millimetre across. But when you consider that the cell walls we're talking about are about a tenth of a millimetre across. They've got a lot of wax to erode there. And they did it. It all went and became straight, standard hexagonal cell sides. So it became zigzagged. Remember I told you that the bases are more fascinating than the cell sides? Oh, yes, they are. So if this hypothesis is true about cell walls starting curved, and becoming flat. Oh, I thought, I wonder if the same is true of the cell bases. How can I demonstrate this? Well, what I did was I started with my plain back plane, pressed some dimples into it to say, start building wax. Don't care where, just here. And I then stuck a piece of acrylic perspex alongside, but not touching. Made that mistake too many times. As long as there's a gap of three or four millimeters, and we'll all know that bees can't get into a gap that size, don't we? They are unable to access the backside of the wax. And so what they do is they quite happily, or sorry, my prediction was, I mustn't preempt myself, that they would build the cells on one side and they would form curved bases to those cells. 
And I then had the fun of, oh, great, now how do I measure those? So I built myself, you know the profile gauges that you can get in your local DIY store for doing the woodwork and stuff like that? I basically built myself a really small profile gauge out of seven hypodermic syringes with some guitar string wire up the middle of them. And so that's <laughs> probing down. Um, so the bass starts curved, not the three rhombi that is declared in the literature. And so what you see here are the um, piece of wax and the back side of the wax and the top photograph, that's after it's been in there for sufficiently long that the cells have formed, and the back side is protected with the plastic film. But nonetheless, you can see the doming on the back side of it much better in the bottom photograph. And then when I removed the protection from the reverse and said, have it, that goes, they then built comb on the back side of it, and then the bases became faceted and just straightened up and became rhombic dodecahedrons, as we all know they're now called. And the proof is obviously in the measurement, so um, I measured one or two cells um, and the kind of profiles that I got using my profile gauge, as you can see, dished, faceted, and also for amusement, I then measured the doming. Now, the interesting thing about the doming is that it is actually raised above the background of the wax. They've not just made it dish-shaped from within the cell, but they've pushed that curve of wax beyond the wax that was there to start with. And this is the presentation of all of the answers. So single side is where they had access to just one side, domed base. Stage two was where I then put them back in the hive for further work, but I, remain, I, I left the cover in place on some of it. So that was after a second stage. And the double is the second stage where they had access to the back, and therefore it has become faceted. And for reference, the yellow block is the measurements that I got just by measuring some natural comb. So the degree of facetedness or lack of curvature that appears in natural. And I think you'll agree that the two domes show that they stay domed and then switch into faceted once they've got access to both sides. Uh, you can also do the same thing by having a thick base layer that simply delays the point at which the two interactions work. So they can work both sides but if they aren't able to interact because the wax is so thick, you still get domes until it is thinned to the point of becoming faceted. And lo, you get the same sort of diagram. So, so far, all of my predictions are holding true. This was fun. I then thought, if they're pushing both sides and making it faceted, well, we, we all know that bees make perfect form. The um, rhombic base gives them the best capacity for the cell. What it did here was to force the bees to make the worst possible cells that one could imagine by putting the dimples and making them then build cells that were directly opposite each other, not half off offset like they normally are. And when the cells are directly opposite, as you can see from the diagram, they erode the base until it meets and then it becomes perfectly flat across the whole cell. So this is actually a flat-bottomed cell that I forced the bees to build. They're just following the rules. I set the conditions. I have some comparative research that I wanted to look at. I looked at this paper because I had the good fortune to write a commentary paper alongside it when it was published. It's a fabulous piece of work. What Smith et al. did was they also are virtually the only other researchers I know that have spent time looking at the, uh, the errors in comb construction. And they got the bees to form multi-tongued start points and allowed them to merge and then applied some really cool um, computer graphics to it so they could do measurements across 
all of the cells and came up with a fabulous amount of data. And their data, just looking at a couple of the transitions, so where the workers voluntarily changed from work comb to drone comb, they looked at the migration across the gap there, and the cell sizes, for example, were worker one side, and then smoothly moved into drone size, and there's smooth transition. The same was actually also true of where the combs came together. If, you, if they were working on drone over here and working on worker over here, as those tongues came together, the merger point across a relatively shallow gap seemed to show a smooth change of cell size from one to the other. And Smith were looking at various measures, the angle of the curves. And all anyway, in their paper, they voiced a conjecture that that distance over which the transitions seem to happen is 15 to 20 millimetres. And that is plenty close enough that a worker could feel both sides of the transition. And so their conjecture was that the bees were actually monitoring the alignment of the cells on both sides of the transition and then selecting the optimum method. I thought to myself, I can do a similar experiment to this. And so what I did was I got the bees to form multi-tongues and then I photographed them as they were building it. Well, I didn't actually. I photographed them by opening them up every three hours, yanking it out and putting it back in again. <coughs> oh, by the way, I can do a talk on how to make a normal hive really, really angry. <laughs> My thinking was that if I could photograph these tongues as they came together, there would be a point where they were sufficiently proximate that the Smith conjecture says I should start seeing some transitional changes. I should start seeing a point at which the bees have adapted the cells in anticipation of the gap closing. And I didn't. There is no point at which they adapt at all. And if you look at that photograph, or those two photographs there, those are points at which two combs have combined. And they are very distinct cells that are perfect according to the alignment on the left-hand side and cells that are perfect according to the alignment on the right-hand side. And where they meet, they meet. They just slam them together. So apparently there's a mismatch between my research and Smith's findings. Smith allowed the comb to be formed over a few weeks and then took it out for analysis. I watched as the tongues were forming, but I did, however, then allow them to complete after the tongues had collided. And the difference is, as you can see from the photograph at the top and the photograph at the bottom, those are the same piece of comb. The top is the point at which the tongues first came into contact, and the bottom is a few hours work later. The bees have satisfied or gave the results that Smith measured because he gave them time to smooth everything out. But there was no anticipation. The reason that honeycomb is formed in this ideal, perfect, and in Smith's research, smoothly progressive fashion is because the bees just keep shuffling things around and make it that way. So, summary. Deposition starts, and the bees start by forming actually a spherical cell. The base starts by being spherical, and that one is highlighted because that's actually between two pieces of wax, and the bees have basically domed it in all three dimensions. So you've got a sphere, and that sphere then extends into a tube when they elongate it. Hexagons? No. Nah. This is an elongated sphere a round-bottomed tube. If you're only building one cell, you'll attempt to maximize the volume in that cell by pushing the walls and making it round. But if you have two cells next to each other, and either one bee is working on each of them, or bees are working on both of them simultaneously, 
they will push and push and come to an equilibrium that is a mutual agreement that the best wall is a straight wall. And if you think about that in three dimensions, uh, sorry, in a uh, three-way interaction, then you get the 120 degrees. And if you then think of that in three dimensions, the object that just spun round is the optimum point at which three sides can meet in three dimensions. And that's the form that you get at the base of the cell. There is no construction that goes on here. It is simply that the bees are shuffling around and trying to get the best they can out of the cell they're building at the moment. Oh, and by the way, there's a bee on the other side trying to get the best that she can for the cells that interact. And the straight sides and the 120 degrees and the rhombic dodecahedrons and the prismatic hexagons just come by mutual push and shove. Thank you. Um, I understand that if you boil peas, they'll expand and form almost perfect dodecahedra. And um, you know, 2D, you get perfect hexagons. Is that effectively what's happening? You're just expanding the comb until it, the cell, until it hits the cell next door. Because each pea is expanding and trying to maximise, if, if you want to um, anthropomorphise it, the pea is trying to maximise its own space. But next to it, they would mutually repel except they're all crammed in. So exactly that. You get mutual push from both, you get hexagonal peas. Or it has as hexagonal as the packing allows. You'll get some randomness built into it. But you see this pattern writ large across almost anything that has some flexibility. And indeed, the Giant's Causeway is a mon monstrous example of balance of forces in that as each of those lumps of rock contracted as they solidified, you've actually got a balance of forces going in the other direction. So hexagons are common in the natural world because they come about by exactly that process. So the, B, the P's are pushing against each other. Um, you see it in fluid dynamics, in innumerable cases, yes. it's. It's a uh, self-correcting algorithm. What happens when, at the beginning of the season, we have um, worker brood comb, um, and then later on they then want to produce drone, and we haven't given them a, a, a super frame to build drone elsewhere. So, and so they build drone comb in the middle. Do they just push and shove? I was about to ask you the question, okay. what, what do they do? The answer is they just destroy it and reform it. Now, I suspect that what they start by doing is saying, this cell's too small, and they push it. And that has a consequential effect on the cells next to it. And um, I didn't, there was too much for me to fit into this talk anyway, but one of the things that I use in the example, I don't need to use it in amongst this audience, but for non-beekeeping audience, I have a photograph of a piece of um, worker foundation that was fully laden and fully laid up and then later in the season it was part of another piece of research I was doing there's an area that has become drone and it is horrendously misshapen drone I mean they're quite capable of building nice regular drone comb but when they're coerced into squeezing it into a worker pattern this not only had distorted cells looking at it in a planar but it had three-dimensional corruption in that they'd actually broken out from the surface and it had come away so, yes, they are. They're just pushing it around. They're tearing the cells down. We've seen from the straight pieces of wax that became zigzagged, they're beautifully adept at taking wax away and reusing it. Um, there are some um, stingless bees that have been studied in South America where they actually keep a store of wax ready for use just inside the hive entrance. So there are plenty of species of wax that, I mean, because wax is such an expensive commodity, it is not wasted. So our bees will tear it apart and then redeposit it. But there are species of social bees that actually tear wax down, and when it's not needed, they will stash it. So, yes, they, they coerce the, the work into it just by moving it. Sorry, a long way of saying yes. <laughs> uh, you just mentioned in... Um, storage of wax just made me think that, that very often you get um, transitional cells that are solid wax and I just wondered if that might be the storage of wax. 
I'm not sure if it's the storage of wax. I've certainly got in um, my research photographs, there are plenty of cases where through artificial means, I've forced them to start cells that are too close together. And you then get um, a pseudo cell that is too small to be used. And the, the, the break point seems to be when it's too small for the bee to get into it. And that's the point at which the mutual push from the cells on each side simply expand them at the expense of the pseudo cell until it becomes solid wax. So I don't know, I haven't asked them, they won't answer my questionnaire as to whether they're storing wax there, but certainly you do get the case where cells will either expand because they can get into them or collapse because the other cells are around and they're unable to expand the one in the middle. Actually, actually, just quickly, um, and it's not a question, it's more an observation, to back up your personal opinion, my observation is that where the bees do re redistribute the wax, um, it's always from those frames which are at the front of the colony. And I run either hot, uh, warm way or cold way, I don't differentiate between them, it doesn't seem to make too much difference, but they always move it from near the entrance way. And we know that the dancers, they, the foragers will come back and they use those combs at the front or near the entrance as to their dance. dance floor, they use that to do, to do their waggle dance and so that's, on. So that does back up your theory. That's a good supporting about, observation, thank you. Yeah, it backs up your uh, vibrational theory. When they take wax away from the side of the frame, you know how combs often, they don't fill the frame eventually, even though you've given them foundation. Yeah. Is it because they are using that wax for other purposes within the comb, or do they really want that space? So Sorry. Richard introduced me as somebody that wants PhD as a calling card so that I can knock on other people's research and just be nosy. And one of the bits of research that I've actually been discussing with a colleague is... She's about to go and work for a, um, a lab in Oxford that does um, vibrational testing on all sorts of animals, and they look at spiders, in particular, the resonant frequency of spider webs. And a research proposal that I put to her came out of a conversation along those lines, and that is that I think, and it's not unique to me, I've probably read it and picked it up and simply adopted it as a good hypothesis, that the cutting away of the corners of comb is to free them and allow them to move. And the reason that they need it to move is when they're dancing, they need a drum surface on which to dance. And the research that I'm proposing that Joanna takes to the spider lab <coughs> is to actually then measure both natural comb full foundation fixed comb and then the tweaked comb where the bees have eroded the corners because when they're dancing for forage um, waggle dancing they're doing it in pitch black there is no sight involved they can only feel the dance and of course if the comb is not vibrating sympathetically they may be misled absolutely no evidence for this other than pure conjecture but that's the kind of research that I'm encouraging in other people, is bringing what we've observed as beekeepers into the science community that may well not have noticed it or reasoned it. And so my personal belief, and it is just pure belief conjecture, that's why they do it. What they do with the wax, however, I'm totally convinced that gets used somewhere else. I, I don't ever see piles of wax wasted on the bottom of a, of a hive. But don't, don't quote me on that other than by saying it's a personal opinion. I've got no science to back that one up yet. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>